Our speaker this morning is here for a second time. He obviously likes us. And from the looks of his books on the cart, we still have room to get him back at least two more times. <laughs> and then by then, maybe he will have written a fifth book. I like his foods. The food is good, too. Right. Right. Decent. Right. So Ted Reinstein has been a reporter for WCDB Genesis 5 Chronicle. Anybody watch Chronicle? <laughs> good, good. They're the nation's longest running locally produced nightly news magazine since 1995. He's been a contributing member of this, the editorial board since 2010. And elsewhere on television, Ted has hosted specials for the Discovery Channel and HGTV. For the Travel Channel's photo adventure series, Free Spring, he explored Hawaii's volcanoes, the caves of Puerto Rico, or Puerto Rico, and the South Pacific Islands of Tahiti. It's a shame that you had to travel yeah, to those places to do that. that. Somebody had to do it, I'm sure. Well, yeah. In 2002, he was part of a chronicle team that received the prestigious National DuPont Columbia Broadcast Journalism Award for Chronicle's coverage of Boston's Big Dig project. In 2018, he received an Emmy Award for his story on the Good Night Light phenomenon in Providence, Rhode Island. He's the author of four books, including New England Notebook, One Reporter, Six States, Uncommon Stories, Wicked Piss, New England's Most Famous Feuds, and co-author with his wife, Anne Marie, in New England's General Stores, Exploring an American Classic. This morning, we'll talk about his most recent book, Four Brooklyn, young son heroes who helped break baseball's color barrier. He's also a member of the Board of Trustees for both Longfellow's Historic Wayside Inn and Suffering and Pebble Beth David in Westwood. Please give a warm brotherhood welcome to Ted Franklin. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. And it is my second time. How many of you were here the first time I spoke? Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, the solar panels weren't here. The, the last time I was here, I, I pulled in. I was like, very nice. Very nice. Um, thank you for having me today. You know, as Sue knows well, we booked and scheduled this talk quite a long, quite a bit before um, October 7th. And um, the time since as others have said, um, have been very, very difficult, painful times for Jews everywhere. And um, I was looking forward from the start to come today and talk about my book. But I have to tell you, on a personal level, I was really looking forward to coming today. Because I know I speak for all of you I say that the past five weeks or so have been times for many Jews that are deeply, deeply unsettling, sometimes one can feel lonely. Mm -hmm. And I felt like today I was looking forward to a party because I'm going to be in a room full of Kavarim and Shvot. So thank you. So I'm going to talk to you about my <clears throat> my most recent book, uh, Before Brooklyn. And I like to start the book, believe it or not, we're going to have Q&A at the end, but I like to start, believe it or not, with a question, because it goes to why I wrote the book. I'm sure, again, like many of you, I have no doubt whatsoever that many, if not most of you, are folks who are concerned and interested in history, and I have always been. And one of the things that I often feel about how we look at history is that very often, as we get further and further away from an event, any event, any achievement, ooh, any event, <coughs> we begin to lose the sense of context that we have when we are present at that event, right? So in other words, even a horrific event like October 7th, we right now in this room, and those of us alive today, have a sense of detail that will simply not be present in 100 years. The event will be, the detail, the context will begin to receive. That's just the way it is. It's like concentric circles in a puddle when you drop a stone in, they get further and further and further apart. This happens with history. So 
in writing the book, I really wanted to draw attention to some of the context, some of the people, some of the human parts of the story of breaking baseball's color barrier, really the first great civil rights victory of the 20th century. Because many of these people's names are lost. These people have become anonymous, and I'm going to prove it to you right off the bat. So, question. After Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947 in Brooklyn, New York, anybody want to hazard a guess on who was the second black major league ball player? Campanella. Roy Campanella, good guess. Walt Tropo, good guess. Dobie. Larry Doby, he's a very good guess. Anyone else? Satchel Page. Page, another good guess. Monty Irvin, another good guess. Very, very close on Monty Irvin. Uh, all great guesses, all in the ballpark, as it were, all wrong. <laughs> no, because it's a bit of a trick question. And this goes to my point. Because after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, the second black major league ball player was Jackie Robinson. Because Jackie Robinson did not do the thing you think he did. Jackie Robinson did not integrate Major League Baseball. There's nothing, you know, like apostasy in saying that. It's the truth. It takes nothing away from Jackie Robinson, who is literally a lifetime hero of mine and all of us. But the point is, he did not integrate Major League Baseball. He reintegrated Major League Baseball because Major League Baseball had been integrated 60 plus years before Jackie Robinson by someone you've never heard of. <coughs> Meet Moses Fleetwood Walker, the first black Major League ball player. How many of you have heard of him? I rest my case. <laughs> so, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, that. Uh, when baseball was in its infancy, in the 1860s, 1870s, the major leagues are formed in the early 1880s, that baseball did look different than we probably think. Because if you think that baseball only included, major league baseball only included black ball players as of 1945, then you would think that major league baseball, 50, half a century or more before that, was all white. It wasn't. It wasn't. Baseball was actually something of an outlier to a chain until it wasn't, but it was. In its infancy, baseball, unlike any other major American institution of its size, was an outlier. It was integrated. Never more than one or two, in some cases three, black ball players on a professional, much less major league team, but it was integrated. How many black Supreme Court justices do you think there were in 1880? Right? So it was an outlier. It looked something more like America. People like Bud Fowler, one of the most impassioned, one of the most exciting early black professional ball players, whose story, you know, I always say that in the, in the, in the book, in my research and my writing, there are many stories you can imagine in looking at a period of history like this that are poignant, sad, only a couple do I term heartbreak? And one of those is Bud Fowler's, as we'll see. But Bud Fowler was one of the most exciting early black ball players. Frank Grant, first black professional ball player from Massachusetts, from the Berkshires. And most famous of all, the Walker Brothers. There's Moses Fleetwood right here. Here's his younger brother, Welby, right here. They were teammates briefly on the 1881 Ohio. Overland Ohio College baseball team, and Moses Fleetwood Walker was, I mean, we use the term transformative a lot, but he was a transformative figure, and not just when it comes to baseball. When it comes to baseball, he was a hugely transformative figure, and that, I mean that word literally, because he transformed an entire position in the sport of baseball, catcher. He was a catcher. Up until this time, the position of catcher in Major League Baseball was considered the single least skilled position on the field. Today, it's the, it's the exact opposite. It's the most skilled position on the field. It was the least, it was where you would stick the worst player on the whole team. Someone who couldn't run, couldn't hit, couldn't throw, basically couldn't do much of anything. However, they were big. They were shockers, right? That's what you were looking for, a shocker, right? And you stick that person behind the plate because they had one job. 
Just keep the damn ball from rolling out the field and interrupting the game. That's all you got to do. Because, no, because there were no backstops there in many, in many places. This is when the term backstop is coined. Today, we think of a backstop, we think of a physical structure, right? No. Then, that was the person. The backstop was a catcher. Because that's what they were there to do. Don't forget, when baseball is growing and the major leagues are formed, we're less than 20 years away from the end of the Civil War. The game is being played on fields throughout the, especially throughout the American South, that have just recently been cleared of rubble from Sherman's March. So there's, you're not talking about tidy little stadiums. So the backstop was the least skilled position. Along comes Moses Fleetwood Walker, an extraordinary actor. He was what we would call in baseball today, there's a term you may have heard called a five-tool player. That was him. He could play every single facet of the game with great skill. He could run, he could hit, he could hit with power, he could feel his position, and he had a cannon for an arm. Can't be ignored. He was so good, he could not be ignored even by white teams, even by the Virgin Major Leagues. And he was signed to play catcher for the Toledo Blue Stockings, which in 1884 was a Major League team. And he was signed to be their starting catcher for the 1884 season. And so this is a huge event for America, which is why he's transformative in a way beyond sports. This was a young black man who was born at a time that slavery still existed, whose parents were born into slavery, and now he is going to become the first black player in the major leagues, which are new. So this was like the feel-good story of 1884, because it's said to a country that, obviously, in less, in less than 20 years earlier, had literally torn itself in two, that this wondrous new national pastime, which hadn't existed before, there had been no such thing as a national major league sport of any kind. That maybe this national pastime can help us bind up our wounds, can be a salve for a nation that's torn itself in half. So this was a tremendously feel-good story in 1884. But you know, there's always somebody for whom what feels good to most people doesn't to another side of things. I mean, we don't have to look much beyond our own present-day political situation, right? So, one of those who did not feel real good about facing the Toledo Blue Stockings with a black ball player starting as catcher just happened to be one of the players with the greatest influence in the entire early game, Cap Anson. Cap Anson, to give the man his due, Cap Anson was the first certified superstar of Major League Baseball. First one. There had been nothing like him. He is still considered one of the greatest ball players of all time. Still holds two or three batting records for the Chicago Cubs, which again, to give the man his due, is extraordinary because he played during what's called the dead ball era. Right? The ball simply didn't go as far. Didn't have a nice little round Super Bowl center like they have today. And yet, he still hit 18 to 20 home runs a year in the dead ball era, which would basically be like hitting between 60 and 70 home runs a year today. So all of this was his due as a player. He was the starting first baseman, slugging first baseman. He was the captain of the Chicago Cubs. Chicago Cubs are the marquee team of early baseball. People travel all night on trains to see the Cubs play and see their dashing captain hit a home run all of which is his due. Also part of the Cap Anson record, he was a vicious bully, he was an unrepentant racist, and apparently he had a very foul mouth. None of which is on his plaque in Cooperstown. <laughs> um, Cap Anson did not like the fact that the Cubs were playing against the team that started a black ball player, and I use air quotes because Cap Anson never used but another word which we, of course, would never, ever use. So that was also part of the Cap Anson story. It didn't like the fact they were playing against the team that fielded a black ball player enough that he played the game officially under protest. Following the game, he filed an official grievance with the owners of Major League Baseball and told them the Cubs would no longer take the field against any team that fielded a black ball player. 
So you can imagine that the owners of Major League Baseball had to take a threat like this pretty seriously. This is the marquee player on the marquee team threatening they won't play against the team that fields black ball players. So they had to take the threat pretty seriously. Now, as Major League executives are want to do, they did the same thing that executives do today. They tried to kick the can down the road and avoid it for a few years, and they did. But it always comes back to bite you in the butt anyway when you're trying to avoid the truth that won't go away. So by the summer of two years later, they had to deal with it, and they met to deal with it in Buffalo, New York, and um, they ceded to Cap Anson's threat in a dramatic vote, which is as dramatic as it was cowardly, because it's a vote and a meeting that has been forever shrouded in secrecy, and apparently now, unless some sort of record bombshell is found somewhere, it ever will be, there is absolutely no record, other than we know that the owners were there, uh, of who was there, who voted how, never know. Not a single person present at that meeting ever took a single question from a single reporter, but the deed was done. The deed was done. It was voted that going forward, no black ball play or would be offered a major or minor league contract, and the color barrier, as we came to know it, became a reality. You know, I mentioned that uh, Bud Fowler and his story was one that I found heartbreaking. Um, I'll tell you why. Because this was a man who lived to play baseball. He didn't care about the politics, didn't want to be a symbol. He wanted just to play baseball. He loved it, he lived it, he played it every day. And when I say that, I don't mean that figuratively, I mean that literally. He played throughout the summer months in North America as fall began up here. He would start working his way down south by November, December this time of year, he'd be in Florida, making his way into the Caribbean, to Cuba. By full-on winter up here, he'd be playing in Argentina, and then he would make his way back up. Living to play baseball. <coughs> With the advent of the color barrier, the reason for his living would no longer be there. He died of a blood disorder in 1913. He was only 55. His unmarked grave told not a word of a truly extraordinary life. For years since the color barrier began to spread in 1887, Fowler had relentlessly fought for a place in organized baseball, along with all the other early black ball players. He had continued to try and play in the shadow of the descending barrier as teams continued to shed black ball players and refused to sign more. He had uncommon talent, there's no question. He's in the Hall of Fame. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame a year ago this past summer, along with Big Papa David Ortiz. But many who observed him felt that his greatest skill seemed to be in just seeming to somehow outrun what everybody knew would be the inescapable end. But Bud Fowler, the end came in Lansing, Michigan in 1997. He was finally completely out of options. They all were. But Bud Fowler was literally the last black ball player standing. He talked about both of them. My skin is against you, Fowler wrote in 1895. If I hadn't been born quite so black, who knows? Might have been able to catch on as a Spaniard or something of that kind. The race prejudice is so strong. My black skin is so black, I'm done. Now, as the 20th century unfolded, they were all done. It would take another 50 years of fierce power like will and determination to break through again. So now we are up to the 1890s, right? And so the 1890s are a period where sort of race prejudice, segregation, racism not only increases exponentially, it's sort of like Jim Crow on steroids, I always say, but you have to remember it's increasing exponentially because it's sanctioned by the state, right? I won't tax you to remember your, your high school history, though many of you may remember and may know, but this is the period of the famous Plessy versus Ferguson, which starts out as a transportation issue in New Orleans, moves over to Alabama, throughout the South, and then through all the country because this is decided in favor 
of the state of Alabama, which is that unless there is a dedicated car for black passengers, then they cannot ride in a train with white passengers. But this goes from a transportation issue to include virtually every facet of American life, including baseball. So what was an outlier is no longer an outlier. Because now it doesn't matter whether you're talking about looking for work, whether you're running for office, whether you're trying to go to school, whether you're trying to get a job, whether you're trying to play baseball, or which side of the room you line up on to get a drink of water in a public water fountain, everything is now segregated. Now, there's another I think, misconception about, just like we started with that misconception about Jackie Robinson and his role in integrating, and as we now know, in reintegrating Major League Baseball, that until Jackie Robinson, Right? Until Jackie Robinson, the blacks did not have the dominant role, any role, in baseball. And nothing could be further from the truth. They were only barred from major baseball. But this is in some ways a period from about 1890 to 1920. This is a period of, in some ways, the golden age of black baseball that's continued, as we'll see with the Negro Leagues, but this is a period where there are, there are many, but more than a dozen, but there are about a dozen incredible black barnstorming teams. This is the barnstorming era, which has often been romanticized. Uh, I, I always say there's nothing romantic about trying to play eight to 10 games a week, three, four, five, six games on a weekend, covering hundreds and hundreds of miles in a rickety old bus, not being able to check into hotels or meet at regular restaurants, not so romantic, but there were about a dozen incredible baseball teams. And when I say incredible, I mean, as good as the Chicago Cubs that were the marquee team. Not every one of them, but many of them were capable of beating the Chicago Cubs. Sometimes they did. These were teams that played against anybody they could because they were trying to make a living doing what they were doing, which is playing baseball all the time. And some of these teams played against major league teams, as I said. That was not uncommon at all. Players were not making the money they're making today, right? They weren't making millions of dollars, as it turns out, a week. They weren't. So they were trying to make any game they could, put it together and play, and they would frequently play against major league teams. So the major league teams that weren't making a lot of money either, although in comparison they were. But, you know, if they had an off day of the schedule, team arrives, let's say, in Baltimore or Cleveland, and has a day before they pick up a three-game series, they would pick up an exhibition game or two. And very frequently, they would lose to some of these black barnstorming teams. My favorite, my favorite example of that is in 1903, when the Cincinnati Red Lights, as they were called then, the Reds, they played a three-game weekend series, three-game weekend series against the Chicago Black Giants, a barnstorming team. Lost all three games. And on Monday morning, the then owner of the Cincinnati Red Lights sent out a memorandum forbidding the team from playing another black barnstorming team. In that series, in that series, a pitcher for the Chicago Black Giants won two games, two out of three games. They were both complete games. You will never see Chris Sale do that. You will never see Chris Sale put you again. Uh, but this, his name, his name was Ruth Foster. Ruth Foster was a immense presence, and I mean that in, in every sense. He was a very, very commanding presence. He became a very successful businessman. He was a very compelling orator, and he was also a fearsome pitcher. He stood about 6'3", weighed about 245 pounds. It would be like a linebacker pitcher who was also tall. That's scary, right? And it was often said, even major league players who stood in against them on, on major league white teams, they would come up with, with you know, phantom injuries to get out of it. Because it was said to be frightening to stand in against this guy's fastball. Now, part of the fear factor in that was that frequently Foster had no idea where the ball was going. So um, that, was a, that was an issue. But he saw something. He saw something. He was an incredible man. And he, he realized something before he finished playing, even, which was that although he realized he would never get back to the major leagues. And by the way, getting back to the major leagues was what kept every black ball player going during this period. It wasn't like they accepted they couldn't play in the major leagues. They understood 
that's showing constantly, constantly, not to the black fans who completely followed them and understood who these players were and what they were typical of, to white America, that they were good enough to play in the major leagues. He understood it was white America that had to get a better sense of what the talent is in black baseball in America. And he understood that will never happen with these nebulous barnstorming teams. There was no scheduling other than what's happening next week. There were periodic attempts at forming an organized league. Both attempts fell apart. He understood. Foster understood. We have to have a league. We have to have a league that is seen as like the Carnegie Hall of black baseball. This is as high as you can get. This is where white America has to see that if you are playing at this high level, this is the platform, this is the showcase, that will be the step necessary to get back to the major leagues. And while others had tried, he did it. He did it. Ruth Foster finally convinced enough people to form the Negro Leagues. We are the ship, was his rallying cry to investors. We are the ship, the Negro Leagues. Everything else is the same. Want to be on the ship or the sea? And it carried the day in 1920, day before Valentine's Day, 1920, in Kansas City, Missouri. The Negro Leagues, the single most important unsung hero in this entire saga, was born. You're looking at the founding class of the Negro Leagues. There's the proud papa right there. There's Ruth Foster. I want to draw your attention to this gentleman right here, right? Sitting right, right there. Only white owner in the entire history of the Negro Leagues. J.L. Wilkinson, owner of, I would say, one of the ten most iconic Negro League teams, the Kansas City Monarchs, where Satchel Page played for many years. Somebody mentioned Page before. Uh, J.L. Wilkinson, uh, only white owner in the entire history of the Negro Leagues. Born in 1920, they begin, obviously, they begin to go away with the advent of the color barrier coming down in 1947, but they really go away over the next 20 years. By 1970, they're gone. Only white owner. Now, I don't bring that up to paint him as a racial peculiarity. I bring that up because, after all, we're talking about breaking the color barrier, right? And spoiler alert, Jackie Robinson is going to make a triumphant appearance just before we're done. But there is a direct line, therefore, a direct line from this day in 1920, 25 years out, boom, straight shot to 1945 and Jackie Robinson. Because Jerry Wilkinson is the Negro League owner who gives Jackie Robinson his first professional baseball job. And then it will just be six months <coughs> until the color barrier falls. So the Negro Leagues are born, and the Negro Leagues take off. And they take off in a way that really, in some ways, replicates the, uh, the major league growth experience in itself. Because they go from the founding class of 14 teams to 16 in short order, 22, 32 teams. They're able to separate into a Negro American League, a Negro National League. They're able to have the first of two Negro League World Series. And it really does seem like the sky will be the limit to the growth of the Negro Leagues. White America now, not just Black America, comes to know who Pops Lloyd is, the first great Black home run hitter. People like Judy Johnson, one of the most colorful ball players in all of baseball history. And it really does seem like as the Negro Leagues grow and take off, it really does seem that um, I used to be able to do this quicker. <laughs> it really does seem like they will um, grow in a way that replicates Major League Baseball, its own explosive growth. Oh, thank you very much. There you go. Thank you. See, it's good to have something in. <laughs> so, and they might have, the sky might have been limited to the growth of the Negro Leagues. It might have been. They start in 1920, and all through that decade of the 1920s, it really does seem like the sky would be the limit. Unfortunately, the sky falls in. Because you know that the decade of the 1920s ends with what? The Great Depression. You know, and I think sometimes we forget, I really do, and I know all of us in this room, and parents, grandparents, relatives who grew up and lived through the Great Depression. My late dad was uh, 10 years old in the worst, worst, worst years of the Great Depression. 
30, 31, 32. And we forget that 25% of Americans were unemployed, a quarter of all Americans unemployed. And in minority communities, flip that. Only a quarter working in many minority communities. More than 30,000 plus businesses going under every year during the first worst years of the Great Depression, including the Negro leagues. Gone, with one exception, gone, up in smoke. Now you might wonder how many of the major league teams went out of business. I mean, each one of the then 16 major league teams was just like those 30,000 businesses. They were thriving American business, subject to the same economic calamity that had just affected those 30,000 that are going out of business every year. So how many major league teams went out of business? Not so many. The reason, which I'm sure you can deduce, is that the major league team, major leagues, unlike the Negro leagues, were pushed by a great deal of wealth. All of the then 16 major league teams were owned by a fabulously wealthy white owner, people like Tom Yockey, uh, owner of the Boston Red Sox. I don't know if you remember what you got on your 16th birthday. <laughs> but Tom Yockey came into the first part of his trust fund at $16.32 million, worth almost twice as much then. Uh, and then five years later, he came into the rest of his trust and another $16.32 million. So he bought the Boston Red Sox. Now, I don't bring this up to you know dump on Tom Yockey. We can do that in other ways. But I bring this up. I bring, that, I bring this up. No, I bring this up to show you just what. I wasn't using that word fabulously, figuratively. To show you just how much the major leagues were pushing from the Great Depression. Tom Young, all that money, 16 major league owners, he's the poorest one. He's the poorest one. We mentioned the Chicago Cubs. Cubs were owned by a guy named Phil Wrigley. I guarantee everyone in this room has used Mr. Wrigley's product at one point in your life. <laughs> Maybe you even have to pull it out of your mouth and stick it under the desk in sixth grade, like I did. But, but, uh, St. Louis Cardinals, speaking of another, huge, right? They were owned by Gussie Bush. He was brewing a little beer out there in St. Louis, out on the East Coast, speaking of brewing beer. New York Yankees, owned by Colonel Jake Rupert. What was he brewing? Knickerbocker. Ooh, good. This is a shock, bro. <laughs> At 10 15, that's pretty good. So, I mentioned there was one exception. So, the major leagues were insulated. I said there was one exception to the Negro leagues going under. They did, with one exception, and we're back to our friend J.L. Wilkinson, owner of the Kansas City Monarchs. Because J.L. Wilkinson was really an extraordinary figure. He really was. He was light years ahead of his time. Extremely progressive, extremely progressive person. And he said to his team on the Depression Day that he would do everything in his power to keep all of his players on payroll as long as they were willing to play baseball pretty much every day. And they did. And they did. They played baseball almost every day. There they are barnstorming their way through Canada during the Great Depression. So this was all very wonderful and generous of, of, of Jared Wilkinson, but there's no way he could have continued to do this indefinitely. It just couldn't have. Fortunately for him, he didn't have to. Because in the worst years of the Great Depression, the very early 1930s, the single most improbable event in this entire story takes place, the Negro Leagues are reborn. Not only that, implausible as that is, which is implausible enough, look where they're reborn. Pittsburgh, ground zero of American unemployment. Highest unemployment in America. They're reborn there. In the worst years of the Depression, when things are not being born, they're dying left, right, and center. And they're brought back by two people who have no business being together, and they did their very best to make sure they never were. Gus Greenlee and Cumberland Posey Jr. Uh, could not be more different other than the fact that they share very few things in common. They are both black men in Pittsburgh. They are both successful businessmen. They both love sports. End of story. Uh, they were lifelong arch enemies. Cumberland Posey Jr. was the son of a pioneering black figure in Pittsburgh, Cumberland Posey Sr., who was the first black licensed civil engineer, started two or three thriving businesses, built a big mansion for his family in the Hill District, the black section of Pittsburgh, and I'm sure he had hoped that his young son, Cumberland Posey Jr., might follow him into the family business, but Cumberland Posey Jr. was a sports fanatic. First basketball, and then baseball, which, wonderful for our story and for baseball, wins out. So he's approached in the late 1920s about saving a Pittsburgh baseball team. 
the homestead graves, which are not famous, weren't so famous then as they are now. They are the second of the three most iconic Negro League teams. Uh, and the homestead grave, homestead section of Pittsburgh, they were going to go out of business if nobody bought the team. He cobbled some money together. He took out some loans. His dad lent him some money, and he was able to buy the team. Now, it's funny how sometimes somebody's greatest skill, somebody's greatest talent, somebody's greatest attribute only comes out through circumstances that they can't predict. Right? Sometimes that's in sports, sometimes that's in any other area of life. And in this case, it was the fact that Composer Jr., although he had coached baseball, had never managed, had never owned a team. And it turns out that he had an extraordinary ability to motivate, to inspire young black men. Now, maybe some of you in your life have had a great coach, and maybe he or she was, you know, that coach that even though you know they wanted you to win and they got pissed off if somebody made a stupid, they still, you always knew. And he's somehow trying to teach me something else here, right? That's what he was. Now, I could go on about composing Junior, but it's easy just to look at the results. The very first year that he owned, managed, coached, general managed, promoted the Homestead Grays, his Homestead Grays went out and had the greatest single season in the history of the sport of baseball which will never be equal. 143 wins. Let me put that in context for you in two ways. Back then, starting. So at that time, Major League Baseball didn't play 162 games. They only played 154. They almost went undefeated. Baseball teams do not do that. It's never happened. It will never happen. It really can't happen. Right? They almost did. Present day, present day, two years ago now, 2021, there were two major league teams, almost three, that cumulatively, all three major league teams, their cumulative wins did not equal 143. That's what they did. Now, his arch enemy, Jeff Greenlee, wanted to outdo him, and he almost did. Completely different story. Gus Greenlee, very hard scrabble, difficult youth growing up, one of six brothers. Goes out to fight in World War One. He's wounded at the Battle of Verdun in France. He's decorated. Comes back home. Now you can't even get a drink to drown your sorrows because it's also prohibition, including in addition to the Great Depression. Fun times. So he needed a job. He cobbles a few bucks together. He drives, a, picks up an old rickety car. He's going to drive a cab. Somebody approaches him after a while. He's driving the cab. He's living hand to mouth, and they say, "Hey, pal, how'd you like to make a little extra money?" He says, "What you got?" So they tell him that they are connected with a major brewery. Anybody ever have a rolling rock beer? <laughs> well, the Latrobe Brewing Company was uh, the illegal Latrobe Brewing Company then. Uh, so they were trying to serve their, 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 the speakeasies that they had contracts with all around Pittsburgh like everybody else was. And so he started driving the bootleg hooch around to all the different speakeasies, making more money. He gets approached a few weeks later by another guy. He said, what do you got? He said, well, I represent most of the bookies in Pittsburgh. We're looking at somebody who's got a car to drive around. All the, all the bets, you know, all the fights, football games. He says, sure, I'll do it. So he starts making money in hand over fist. He realizes at a certain point, because he's a smart cookie and a good businessman, if I could cut out the middleman, I could have all of this. So he does. I don't mean like cut them out, but he did go with the business all by himself. Then he was making some very, very serious money, which is the understatement of the year. So at one point in 1932, Gus Green was making $17,000, wait for it, a week. Do you know what that kind of money is in the Great Depression? That's multiple millions of dollars a week today. So he didn't know what to do with all his money. Literally. He's looking for all kinds of things to, to, to do with his money, and especially launder his money, because most of it's from, from stuff like gambling and so forth. He opens up a jazz club. Great story, though, the Crawford Grill. Crawford Grill, Google it sometimes. It's a great story. He opened up this grill that was really a mecca. For jazz greats, you name the jazz great, Billy, Ella, Cat Calloway, they all played the Crawford Grill, Crawford Avenue, the Hill District of Pittsburgh. 
great, I don't know how much you like jazz. What you like was a great way to launder over his dirty money. So he's doing that. Then somebody approaches him about another baseball club in Pittsburgh that's going out of business. He said, sure, I don't know how much you like baseball. Another great way to launder more money. So he opens up his own baseball club. And a year after his arch enemy wins 143 games, Gus Greenlee, now the proud owner of the renamed Pittsburgh Crawfords, the cross promotions jazz club, goes out and wins almost 100 games. Yeah. And he did it the same way he achieved most everything else in his life. Uh, he stole it. Uh, by that I mean, no, by that I mean, by that I mean, he, by that, he was actually something of a Robin Hood figure in Pittsburgh. He really was, to be fair. Uh, it was well known in Pittsburgh at that time among black families in the Hill District that if you were sick, if you had a kid who was sick, if you couldn't pay the mortgage, if you fell behind, whatever, all you had to do was get word to Gus's people. A little longer, like the slide under your door. So I think that has to be part of the record. But he was a don. He was a thief. So, <laughs> so he's trying to come up with a better team than his than his than his arch nemesis. So what better way to do better than his arch enemy than to pick off the two best players on his enemy's team? So he did. Well, again, to be fair. They both made an art form out of coaching each other's best players. They did it in the beginning of the season, the end of the season, in the middle of the season, and in one celebrated instance, which I, I still don't fully understand, they did it in the same inning. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, the officials tore or quit. So, so they, he picked up, when I say he picked up the two best players on, on the Homestead Grace, again, understatement of the year. They were, but far and away, the two best players on the Homestead Grace. They're also two of the best players who have ever played the sport of baseball. One of them was a lanky young pitcher named Satchel Page. The other was an incredible young slugging catcher by the name of Josh Gibbs. Now, it is impossible to overstate. I always say that Gibson and Page, Gibson and, and Satchel Page, are the only two sung heroes in the book. There's nothing unsung about either one of them. Satchel Page is bigger than life. Really was. Satchel Page was bigger than life. He was, he was a reporter's best friend. He was always had something funny to say. Many of his quotes have now entered, you know, the lexicon. Uh, and, and, you know, in, 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 in its way, it's interesting that he was very close to Josh Gibson, who was the polar opposite. Very, very tragic life. Very shy. Almost never spoke. Always like to say, I let my back do the talking. And the two of them, both of them in the Hall of Fame, Satchel Page, Legendary, he would be on my personal list of the five greatest pitchers I've ever played. Josh Gibson was an incredible slug. People, I love this story that people, people would come to the ballpark to hear, it didn't say watch, to hear Josh Gibson take batting practice because he's wrong with the bats, of course. They would close their eyes and they would wait to see if they could tell when Gibson was hitting because they said it sounded like the ball literally exploded mm -hmm. on impact. May have hit the longest home run ever hit in Yankee Stadium, 500 plus feet. And no, even in his own playing days, right? Biggest testimony of all. He was known in his own playing days as the Black Babe Ruth. My funniest favorite story for painting is Jerry Gibson, or Babe Ruth for that matter. Late in his playing career, he met Babe Ruth. They met at some event in New York, and Babe Ruth put his big meaty arm around. Josh Gibson, I guess I gave him the, he probably liked to shake people a little bit when he met, and he said, Mr. Gibson, what a goddamn arm. Hey, I understand they called you the Black Babe Ruth. How about that? And Josh Gibson looked at Babe Ruth and he said, well, Mr. Ruth, why people call you the White Josh Gibson? <laughs> How about that? So, we've been talking about the Negro Leagues. To the whole beginning of this talk, and that's as it should be, because they're the most important part of the story. But here's the question. Here's the question. How do we know so much about the Negro Leagues? We shouldn't. We shouldn't know very much about the Negro Leagues at all. Why? The Negro Leagues didn't keep track of what they were doing. Never did. Negro Leagues didn't have statisticians, <laughs> historians. The Negro Leagues were hand-to-mouth operations concerned with whether or not they had enough basketballs, uniforms, cleats, a bus, and gas for the bus to get to a goddamn game. That's all they were concerned with every single day. 
They didn't have statisticians. They didn't have the seven and a half floors you have in New York City today. You can look up the very first major league game ever played. You can see stats for the entire game. Not legally. They couldn't afford statisticians. So they weren't keeping track of what they were doing. The white mainstream press never kept track of the Negro Leagues, regardless of what you made. Never. So they did cover Negro League games when a major league team played a Negro League team. They, they, would, they would often keep track of those games. They'd cover those games. But in the entire history of the Negro Leagues, there was not ever one single dedicated beat reporter for one single mainstream newspaper that was assigned to the Negro Leagues. Not one team, not the whole Negro League. So if the major leagues, if the, if the mainstream press was not keeping track of the Negro Leagues, and the Negro Leagues themselves weren't keeping track of what they were doing, how is it we know so much about the Negro Leagues? The answer, the second most vital unsung hero in the entire story, second only to the Negro Leagues themselves, the black press. You know, the black press still exists, but in a fraction of the way it once did. Because today, thankfully, if you are a, a, an African American in any major American city, anywhere really, right, you want to see what's going on that might affect the black community, you'll find that. In the New York Times, you'll find that in the Boston Globe, you'll find that in the Tribune in Chicago, not that. Not that. Nothing that was of interest to your community was covered in a white mainstream newspaper. So these were necessary, necessary newspapers. They were started by pioneering publishers like Robert Lee Van of the Pittsburgh Courier, greatest distribution of any black newspaper in history, second only to the Robert Sainzak Abbott's equally famous Chicago Defender. And they hired great pioneering sports writers like Wendell Smith and Sam Lacey, who not only were charged with covering the Negro Leagues, but more importantly, were charged with reminding their readers that regardless of how great these teams are, regardless of how great a player like Page or Gibson is, they can't play in the major leagues. They were told by these publishers to remind their readers all the time. Those people forgot. Don't forget the color fell in 1887. Right? 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. You just forget. You just go to a major league game, the Red Sox against the Indians or whatever, and you just, you didn't expect to see a black ball playing. You didn't think about it. He made sure that America was reminded. So that in 1939, when Satchel Paige pitched for the New York Black Yankees against the New York Yankees at the stadium, and struck out Joe DiMaggio three times. Only time in DiMaggio's entire career he struck out three times. Wendell Smith made sure that people knew how extraordinary that was, and people were impressed. They were impressed everywhere. They were impressed in Boston. They were impressed in Fort Worth. They were impressed in Framingham. They were impressed in Biloxi. They were impressed in Phoenix, Spokane, Duluth. You get the idea. How? Listen to what I'm saying. These tiny hand-to-mouth black newspapers that were concerned with just hitting the black newsstands in the black community five nights a week. How <laughs> they get their papers delivered all over the country? The next most incredible unsung hero, and the one that I, I knew something about some of these people before I wrote the book. I knew nothing about the role of the Pullman Porters. The most fascinating unsung hero to me, in the book, when you think about the Pullman Porters, you think about, I'm sure, what they were. Just what they were. The Pullman Porters were the face of the overnight train travel in the golden age of rail, from the 20s to about the 50s, and kind of dying out by the 60s. And the Pullman Porters would, 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 would you know, take your bags on the platform, they'd show you to your seats, later they might show you to the dining room, they might turn down your berth later on. They were servants on wheels. That's not my description. That was the mission statement of George Mortimer Pullman, who created the Pullman Porters. That's what they did. So what the hell did they have to do with baseball? I mentioned that those newspaper publishers were pioneer men. They were men. These, these, most of those old publishers were men. There were some amazing, extraordinary women sports writers that are part of the story and that are in the book. But these two guys in particular, Abbott in Chicago, and then in Pittsburgh, they looked at the porters. Right? So if you're a newspaper publisher, it is all about selling newspapers. Like today, if you own a website, it's about eyeballs. 
and how long you can keep eyeballs on your page. With newspapers, still, and then, it is about selling a paper. It doesn't matter whether you wrap fish in it afterward or put it in the kitty's kitty litter tray. It doesn't matter. But if you sold the newspaper, you've increased your distribution by one. Right? They looked at the Pullman Porters and they saw an incredible ally if they could only recruit some of them. These are black Americans who are traveling all over the country, every corner, at a time when not just black Americans, Americans in general, are not traveling all over America in the 1930s. They are. And they realize that if they could somehow be persuaded to help surreptitiously deliver our papers to black communities all over America, think of what that could do, both for our newspapers, but for the cause of breaking the color barrier and civil rights. And they were they didn't need every quarter on every run. They only needed a few a week. It runs north, south, east, west, and so forth, and they got them. They got them. Now, any one of these porters doing this would have been fired on the spot. Not a single one ever was. So you might wonder, how did this work? How did this work? Well, the Pullman porters were also responsible for provisioning the train, right? They worked the kitchen. So let's say a train is leaving Boston South Station. It's going to make a run down the entire eastern seaboard through Philly, D.C., Chattanooga, all the way down to my head. Right. So the Pullman Porters might have a deal with a local, a local black bakery in you know, Mattapan, Forest Hill, Rock Street, Dorchester. So the little bakery truck would roll up. At that time, you could drive right out onto the platform. Be a little truck, little five-foot platform in the back, six-foot-tall wicker baskets filled with bread. What do you think was under the bread? <laughs> the black newspapers of Boston. The Boston Guardian, the Boston Recorder, the Boston Chronicle. All underneath the bread, the train takes off. First stop, Penn Station. They offload the black newspapers from Boston. They onload the Afro-American and the Amsterdam News in New York. They do the same thing in Baltimore, same thing in Philly, all the way down the East Coast. And so in this way, they're doing this all over the country. And in this way, you have, in 1939, to connect back with that game that Page pitched against the Mafia, you have the following happen. You have a New York Times executive who's vacationing in L.A. And he gets up in the morning, I'm sure he got up very early, put on his little fedora, like lit up a, a lucky strike, unfiltered, he's walking down Hollywood Boulevard, he's looking for a newspaper, at the newspaper stand, he can't find the Times. But he keeps seeing the Pittsburgh Courier, which last time he checked, couldn't find its way out of Pittsburgh. Now it's beating the Times to L.A. <laughs> that was the Pullman Porters. So we're up to 1940. And spoiler alert, the color barrier is going to fall. But how? Because in 1940, as the decade begins, baseball is no closer to dropping the color barrier than it had been in 1930, 1920, 1900. Part of the reason is this guy. Kennesaw Mountain Landis in 1940 is the still going energizer bunny with a cigar. <laughs> he is still the commissioner of Major League Baseball. How long has he been commissioned at this point? Kennesaw Mountain Landis was the first baseball commissioner <laughs> in 1912. And he has never, and not now either, wanted to discuss the color barrier. Ornery. Ornery is a word you find most often attached to describing Kennesaw Mountain Landis. And that's from his wife. But, uh, the thing is, he was, <laughs> I didn't talk yet, but I couldn't have <laughs> He was very funny, very stubborn. I'm pretty sure he was probably sitting in the no smoking section. And he did not want to discuss. So what happens? What happens after 1940? Well, for one thing, Mr. Landis dies. And Happy Chandler, former governor of Kentucky, who actually is open to at least discussing the color barrier, becomes commissioner. But more importantly, what happens in 19? In the 1930s, same way that the 1920s ends with a worldwide cataclysm of the Great Depression, the 1930s ends with what? The advent of World War II. And in New York, finally, a lanceman takes the stage. <laughs> uh, you may never have heard of Lester Rodney, but that doesn't mean he's not a crucial, crucial unsung hero in breaking the color barrier. Didn't set out to be, didn't realize he would be while he was doing it. 
But Lester Rodney was a gifted young sports writer. There he's in retirement in California, but he was a gifted young sports writer. He would have written for anybody. And he's not anybody's picture, by the way, of someone who was a vital ally in the struggle to break the color barrier. He doesn't look the part. He wasn't. He was in New York, for one thing, which was not a center of the struggle at that point. It had mostly been Washington, Pittsburgh, Chicago. So he's in New York. He's white. He's Jewish. He's communist. Hey, nobody's perfect. Okay? <laughs> but he loves baseball. Hates the color party. Finds it offensive. And he would have written for anybody. He would have loved to have written for the Times. You know, why not? Couldn't get a job. Trying everybody to get a job. In 1938, the American Communist Party's newspaper, The Daily Worker, starts a sports section. Smart. Seems like another way to reach people. They start a sports section and they need an editor. He got the job. Great trivia question. Great answer to a trivia question. The only sports writer in American history who, in his wallet, held both a Sports Writers Association of America and the Communist Party. But he, uh, he began to include in all of his comments, all of his sports comments, he began to include something that was actually quite prophetic. And I don't mean even for just sports, because people were not thinking in the late 1930s. Listen, Hitler took power just after 1930. So a lot of historians will tell you people could have seen what was coming, okay, all during the 1930s. And shame on the world. Forever. We're not realizing that. He did. And he saw by the mid to late 1930s, there's only going to be one way to stop this. Maniac, and that's going to be for America to go to war. We're going to have to help stop this. And we are going to go to war, I guarantee it. People didn't want to hear that, you know, in the late 1930s, right? You had a lot of people, unfortunately, some now and then today, that are into this isolationism. Like somehow we're not a part of it all, right? That's what a whole faction of Americans were feeling in the late 1930s. So they didn't want to hear this, but he was writing it nonetheless. We will go to war. You mark my words. Whites as well as blacks will go off to fight and defend democracy. Whites as well as blacks will be asked to die if necessary for freedom. The difference, he pointed out, and don't forget it, is that those who are black who have just been asked to die for their freedom will come back to America where their freedom is not as absolute as their white comrades. And they will still not be able to ride where they want on a bus or play major league baseball. This is the argument that brings the color barrier down. Not right away, but you know, sometimes we've seen it in our own lifetimes. Sometimes I think an issue that has at its core a certain morality begins to fall of its own weight, of the immorality. We saw it happen. I would venture. I'd say, I, I think we saw that happen with marriage equality, and I think that's what happens with now. As we're going to war, as we are going to war, people now see that because Lester Rodney is making them see it in that way. Yeah, you know, that's not fair. Right? That's not fair. This is the argument that will bring the color barrier down. It's picked up by others. It's picked up by, we talked about the Pittsburgh Courier. It's picked up by the Pittsburgh Courier. And the double victory campaign is launched because of Lester Rodney's argument. The double victory campaign was meant to help young black men and women who were going off to fight to help them rationalize what was, for many of them, an agonizing choice. Yeah, I, I want to fight for America, but yeah, it doesn't feel so great to be asked to die, but I come home, I can't sit where I want on the damn bus. Double victory was meant to help them rationalize that. Yes, fight. Double victory. Go fight. Defeat Adolf Hitler, victory won, come home, defeat Jim Crow. Victory two, they handed out those handkerchiefs, those double D handkerchiefs and all their newspapers, those were picked up on and worn in the bomber jacket sleeves of the Tuskegee Airmen. 
the most famous all-black unit in the Second World War, but it is another all-black unit that I bet you've never heard of, the 761st original Fight the Black Panthers, the all first all-black armored unit that will take us to the end of our story from the part of a tank. The 761st celebrated all-black unit, first all-black armored unit in American military history. Uh, they set records for days, consecutive days at the front. They were one of the first units to cross over into Germany and one of the very first units to liberate a death camp from the ball. To our story, they were led by a dashing young lieutenant named Jack Roosevelt Robinson. Jackie Robinson got a lieutenant strike at Fort Kearney in Kansas in 1939. By 1940-41, he had been transferred to Fort Hood in Texas to help take command of the 761st. And Jackie Robinson could not wait to lead the 761st into combat against the Nazis. Never got that. 761st did. Without their young lieutenant. Just before the 761st was scheduled to ship out, Jackie Robinson flunked his final physical in Fort Hood. An old injured. He'd been an All-American halfback at UCLA. An old football injury in his knee, reared its ugly head, not clear for combat. Desperately sought permission to accompany the unit as a special morale officer, request denied. He was crushed. Greatest disappointment of his life. The unit shipped out. Jackie Robinson shipped back to Fort Hood. Some go to the Black Officers Club, get a drink, drown his sorrows, jumps on a bus for Hood still today, one of the two most Two largest military bases in the entire world, huge military base, constantly being circled by buses. And so when he jumped on a bus, took a seat right behind the driver in the front row. You might wonder where this is going. <laughs> so at that time, blacks, whether or not you were a black officer, whether or not you were a returning service member who had lost a limb, you were expected to give up your seat. If whites began to fill up the seats of the bus. So the bus is moving along, whites begin to fill up the bus, the bus driver. Now Jackie Robinson knew something that night, though, that the driver undoubtedly did not know. He testified later in court that he didn't know. Who knows? Doesn't matter. But Jackie Robinson knew, for a fact, that 48 hours earlier, President Roosevelt had signed an executive order prohibiting segregation on transportation on domestic American military bases. Robinson knew, I can sit where I want. And he did. The bus driver tells him to move. When the bus fills up, Jackie Robinson refuses. The driver pulls over to a sentry post. Two MPs come on the bus. They handcuff Jackie Robinson, lead him off the bus. He's arrested, court martialed, insubordination. How many of you know that Jackie Robinson was once court martialed for insubordination? Right. So there's a funny, weird logic when I say this, but that doesn't should be. Because if you knew that Jackie Robinson, had been court-martialed, no one else would know who Jackie Robinson is, because he would never have been able to be signed by Grant Shirley and break the public value. But he beat the court martial. So now he's out of one job, the Army. He resigns. He's given an honorary discharge, but he needs a new job. And somebody tells him about this owner of the Negro League team, remember, Kansas City Monarchs. And some of his best players, he's told, are not yet back from theater in Europe. He said, why don't, you, why don't you get in touch with him and see if he needs some players? I bet he does. So he does. He writes him a letter. And J.R. Wilkinson gets the letter. Doesn't write back. Picks up the phone. Calls him. I would have loved to have been on this phone call. You can read most of the transcript in Jackie Robinson's autobiography. But he says, uh, he says I look at Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson's on Jackie Robinson. Yeah, I know who you are, Jackie Robinson. He says, I understand that uh, you're looking for work. He says, yes, sir. Well, I'm not giving you a job. What? Long, long pause. I'm not giving you a job that you have to try out for. You asked me for a tryout. Did you not? He said, yes, sir. I'm not giving you a tryout. I don't understand. I'm giving you a job. So he tells him to get to Houston immediately where he is going to join the Monarchs in spring training to start the 1945 Negro League season. So he does. Now, next question. How many of you know that less than three weeks from the time this photo was taken in Kansas City, Jackie Robinson 
would not be in Kansas City, but would be less than an hour from here, on the field, Fenway Park, trying out for the Boston Red Sox. Because at the same time this picture is being taken, in Boston, this man is hard at work trying to find a way for the Red Sox to try out Jackie Robinson. He doesn't know Jackie Robinson, but he does know Lester Rodney's argument, and he's completely bottled. And he's saying to himself, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do with what I have to make this change, to bring down the color barrier? What is a step that I can do? Is the Machinet extraordinary and in some ways tragic figure? Oh, it's been fascinated as much. They used to read about his name all the time because if you follow Boston's baseball history and the Red Sox, then you know that Izzy Muchnick was the only the second Jewish Boston City Council. He would become the first Jewish chairman of the Boston School Committee, and Izzy Muchnick succeeded in a way no one else did anywhere in forcing a major league team to have a tryout for black ball players. Izzy Muchnick was a devout Jew. He lived by Tikkun Olam preparing the world at every opportunity, and this was the way he thought he could help prepare the world. Now, he was also, he was also a gifted young lawyer, could have worked for any law firm in Boston, graduated at the top of his class, both Harvard undergrad and Harvard Law, not too shabby, could have worked for any of what they used to call the white shoe Boston law firm, with a right like Hale and Dorr and Palmer and Dodge and the Schmucker and Scooby, whatever. But, <laughs> but, he was too ethnic. <laughs> he, he, he was looking at name as much Nick. That's not going on the shame. Well, so he wouldn't sign. He wouldn't change his name. And he opened up his own law firm. And he understood that in trying to approach the Red Sox to have a tryout for black ball players, it wasn't enough to ask nicely. He needed juice. He needed lunch. But how to how to get it? How to get it? And then he found it. He found it late one night for his kitchen table, he's pouring all through city ordinances and zoning, he's looking for some legal leverage that might force the Red Sox in some way, and then he found it, and he found it courtesy of those old barnacles that are mostly gone now, the old blue laws, remember that? Well, there was a blue law still on the books in 1945 that stipulated you could not play Major League Baseball on a Sunday in Boston without the unanimous vote of the Boston City Council. And Izzy Machnick, I've always imagined, must have been sitting there and took his glasses off and pinched himself. <laughs> so he must have said to himself, I'm on the city council. <laughs> All I gotta do is withhold my vote. And that's what he did. And he wrote to the Red Sox Brain Trust. There they are. They're jockey. Player manager Joe Cronin. General manager Eddie Collins himself, a former Hall of Famer. And Muchnick wrote, Mr. Collins, I am writing to you to humbly ask you if you would consider giving a tryout, not a job, just a tryout, to some of the deserving, as he wrote, six colored ball players who are returning from the war and who are accomplished ball players, if you would simply offer a tryout to these players. And Eddie Collins, who is kind of a loquacious southerner, he wrote back and he said, my, my esteemed counselor, consider this a He said, uh, certainly empathize with your request. He said, it might, however, be good to point out to you that in my entire tenure with the Boston Red Sox, we have not had a single colored ball player inquire about employment. We've concluded there's no interest. Yours cordially, well, Izzy Muchnick was a bulldog. He was a bulldog as an attorney. He was a bulldog when he played golf for Harvard with no mask, and he understood that he was taking a load of income and you know what. So he waited. He waited a little bit. Right? Everybody's best weapon. Patience. So he waited a little bit. He waited until it was a week to the day that that vote in the city council would be held. And he sent a cablegram, much for to Eddie Collins, and he said, Mr. Collins, it appears you have no interest in entertaining my humble request, and therefore this table should serve to inform you that when the vote is held on Sunday baseball in the city council chambers Wednesday next, I will be withholding my vote. 
I don't know what the actual time duration was from the time that Eddie Collins opened up that table and the time that he appeared in his boss, Tony Alpi's office. I have a very strong sense it was well under five minutes and he was running. Because this would have been a cataclysm financially. 1945, pre TV, every Major League Baseball in 1945, every Major League Baseball team plays two games every Sunday. The Red Sox would have been denied 50% of their Sunday revenue. It is unthinkable. So, they send the cable back, fine. It's actually what they said. Fine. You can have your try. Three players. That's it. Three. No press. If there's any press, the deal's off. Have your players at Gate B, Fenway Park, Monday morning, April 12th. You're through. Well, Izzy Muchnick knew a lot about Boston bylaws. He did not know a lot about black baseball. So, he sought out uh, Ben Wendell Smith. Sports writer for the Pittsburgh Courier, and he asked him if he would hand select three qualified black ball players, and he did. One of whom was Jackie Robinson. And they came to Boston, and they checked into a hotel, and they were all prepared to try out on Monday, April 12th, 1945. No trial. Because on Monday, April 12th, 1945, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt died. In America, Shut down. 24 hours later, America begins to open back up. 48 hours later, America's pretty much back to normal, except at the offices of the Boston Red Sox, <laughs> where they appear to be still in the throes of inconsolable grief, which is odd because they were all, every single one of them, registered Republicans. But the thing is, but the thing is, they were trying to, they were trying to run the clock. <laughs> That's what they were trying to do. And they almost made it. All they had to do was get to Thursday, April 16th, when they were scheduled to take the train to New York, because on the 17th, the next day, they will open up the 1945 season at the stadium against the Yankees. They almost made it. But on the morning of April 16th, 1945, a white sports writer, Dave Egan, of the old Herald American, broke the story. Front page, it went to all the other papers within hours. Front page, he did it as kind of a letter to Boston. He said, Dear reader, you're not aware of it, but at this hour, there are three qualified Negro baseball players who have been marooned in a Boston hotel room for a week. They have been promised a tryout with your Boston Red Sox, who have now reneged on that promise and are prepared to leave town. Well, the Red Sox knew they were have. They knew they had to have the tryout. So they called up Muchnick. They said, Get them all here. So he did. Is he Muchnick? led the players to Fenway Park, they got on the field, they suited up, they took the field, ran the bases, took some infield, took some batting practice. Less than an hour later, about 15 minutes later, they were called off the field. Joe Cronin thanked them very much, told them the Red Sox will be in touch. Never did. Never did. None of the players ever heard from the Red Sox the rest of their lives. But you know who was paying rapt attention that week? About 200 miles south from Brooklyn Heights at the executive offices of the Brooklyn Dodgers, branch. And he was horrified as he began to get reports that Tom Yorkie, who he loathed, by the way, <laughs> was trying out Jackie Robinson, who Branch Rickey has had a plan in place for almost a year to make the telephone. Now, we know that if we could have gone back in time, we could have told Branch Rickey, Branch. <laughs> it's okay. You got time. You got plenty of time. How much time? 14 years. That's how much time it's going to take Tom Yaki to make the elevator. So relax. Have another cup of coffee. For goodness sake. But he didn't know that. He didn't know that. So as soon as the season ended in 1945, September, Jackie Robinson was hustled to Montague Street in Brooklyn Heights, right there, signed a contract. For the Brooklyn Dodgers' top minor league team, the Montreal Royals. And of course, the rest <laughs> is history. Isn't it? <laughs> Wearing number 42, as he showed out in his position at first base, amid the din of cheering fans, of flash faults announcing history, and the din, there was also the inaudible sound of a wall falling, and of a cheering that could not be heard with the ear. 
only to the heart. It rose from those not present physically, but spiritually. Those who could not be seen, but were there, just the same. Moses sleep with Walker, didn't let see it. And by the time he died, broken, bitter, alcoholic, buried in death, he couldn't imagine. But he was there. Bud Fowler was there. Bud Fowler, who had tried his entire life to simply just keep playing baseball as long as he could, wherever it took him, now was in Brooklyn. The Pullman Porters, who had spread the story of the color barrier all along America, long after it had been forgotten, on this very day now, some of them were passing north, south, east, west, within a mile of Ennis. They were there. The Negro League was past and present. Those who would come to early and those who thought they might now be able to walk through the wall too, they were there. And the African American veterans of the war just ended, and those who had indeed given their lives, they were there. On this momentous day, a ball game was played before a crowd, both present and cheering, and another crowd silent and unseen. They watched the game, and they watched the terrible wrong being finally lighted. To be sure, even as a black ball player bounded onto an otherwise all-white field, racism was still alive and well in Brooklyn and clear on across America. So many other barriers remained in place, and it's still on. But on this day, some of the hurt and humiliation was sad. On this day, hope and faith that had long seemed to have run out seemed to be magically repeated. On this day, the long arc of the moral universe seemed to bend improbably toward Brooklyn. Touching down on the dirt and the grass of a creepy old ballpark where the familiar white lines would no longer bar a black ball player. And when Jackie Robinson came to bat in seventh and right there and laid down a perfect bunt, that invisible crowd was right there with him as he raised the first base, willing to fall, willing to fall. And as Robinson sprinted safely on the second base and caught his breath, they had sailed him after all. It had been a long, uncertain 60-year journey, and they helped him get there. The next stop to that had doubled. Jackie Robinson rounded third, and he was home. Thank you. Thank you. I was impressed by uh, something that was probably kind of dumb based on everything you had to say, which was really interesting. You had two slides of two uh, Full teams. Yeah. Both of them featured one 14 and the other 15 men, and both had records of over 100 games. Yes. And now I look at today's roster of the guys that can't make it through three in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just shocked that these guys would play this many games and be whole. Yeah. And so there's no record, of course, of history of arms being thrown out or anything of that nature. And yet, arms were thrown out. Um, arms have always been thrown out, and other injuries. The thing that comes across when you look at the history of the Negro Leagues, they did not have the infrastructure in place. They didn't have trainers. They didn't have dressing rooms half the time. Okay, So basically, you got bloodied up, you just got back out there. They were incredibly resilient because they had to be. They had to be. And, you know, it wasn't the job you could afford to lose. It really wasn't. It really wasn't. There was no deep benches. There were no deep benches. They didn't have room on a bus for a bench. So all of those things, you're absolutely right. You know, all of those things, you know, make you marvel at the lack of luxury that players enjoy today. You know, as it, you know, Chris Sale, I joked about him before. But, um, but there were no words. There were no words. This guy's you know, ma making you know, as much money as Elon Musk for not even playing, working a job. So, it's like, you know, what is, you can't, you talk about you can't get that job. Yeah, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Anyone else? Yeah, so you mentioned when Jackie Robinson tried out the Red Sox, there were three back black ball players. Yes. Who were the other two? Marvin Williams of the Ohio Buckeyes and Sammy Jeffro. Somebody mentioned Sammy Jeffro earlier. Yes. Yep. 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 Yes, in 1961, I was working in a law firm in New York, and I met Jackie Robinson at the Bombers down the bat. Bombers down the bat. That's what I said. More. You are number five. You are the fifth person I've met in my talks who met Jackie Robinson. Yeah, he was handling disability. I will talk to number five. <laughs>
By the way, family disability claims for the Chuck Fuller or not. That's right, Chuck Fuller. That's was his big job. Yes, that is great. I have actually met people who not only met Jackie Robinson, but it's it's other people, many more than five, but who grew up in Brooklyn and remember going to Ebbets Field, and uh, which is long gone. But uh, that's great. That's great. I love to hear that. I love to hear that. I want to take this note myself uh, to say thank you very much for having me here again. Now, I really... I mentioned, I, I mentioned before about really what if we talk about a bomb, you know, it feels like a bomb to me to be among, you know, mishpucha, uh, because a lot of the times now we, uh, we are, that feeling right now uh, is tough, it's tough, and this is sort of a room where, you know, I feel like it was possible to just all sit and enjoy some good food and good company, so I appreciate you're having me here to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you.